Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is chapter 28x, my Fire Emblem 7 Hector Hard Mode, 0% gross playthrough, I am Don Don 51. I am Mecha. Fire Emblem, among its 16 games, reuses map concepts several times, and some of these map designs fit into particular archetypes. This chapter, Night of Farewells, fits into the Disappearing Water Tile archetype, which only really exists in two games, this game and its predecessor. And I can imagine why, because like most other maps that belong to certain archetypes like desert maps and boat maps, only a minority of Fireman players really like them. They're pretty unpopular among casuals. And the gimmick with this map is that there are a bunch of islands that separate the starting point from the seas point. And in order to traverse these islands normally, you have to make your way across these narrow bridges that appear and disappear on a turn counter. And the problem is that if you're not going at the pace that the chapter expects you to, and you didn't bring sufficient water traversing units, then it's possible for units to get stuck after the waterway disappears and be unable to do anything for most of the remainder of the chapter. And if your options are taken away from you like that, that's just really frustrating. But if you know how to approach this map, it can be really interesting. Well, I hope so, because when I play this chapter, I just get really, really annoyed with how everything goes down. So we continue the trend in this prep menu to promote units in pairs, and this time it's the turn of Lucius and Priscilla. Priscilla is actually not being deployed for this chapter, she's going to sit this one out. We're just doing this promotion to get her out of the way. But Lucius is going to be a significant player in this one. He gets two important things from this promotion. One of them is C-Rank Staz, which everyone knows about. It enables him to use Barrier, but he also gets a boost to his Light Magic rank, and that lets him use Purge. And the fact that that is important to this chapter strategy shows just how strange and intricate it is. So on this map, there are a lot of long-range threats that are very tricky to deal with because they start isolated from your starting position. They can often hit you without you being able to hit them back. And we're talking about things like ballistas, long-range tomes like bolting, status stabs, and of course flyers as well. The only way you can get to these kind of threats is using flyers or berserkers. Now our flyers are kind of busy rescue dropping people around, and they're also not that great at combat in 0% growth. Berserkers are pretty good, like Hawkeye is, but the problem is this map is not covered in normal water, but in Gatorade, and that makes his boots all sticky, and it gives him a 3 movement penalty, kind of like the lakes in Chapter 25, so he cannot get very far either. But he does have enough move to reach an archer with a hand axe on turn 1, and that's good, but it still leaves two enemy bow users alive on the island. The sniper remains a big problem because he's promoted, so he is a bit bulkier than the other archers on that island, so the way that we opt to deal with him is to berserk him, now this is a bit interesting because from my prior experiences playing this game and from other playthroughs, the preferred method to incapacitate the sniper is to put him to sleep, but we don't have a sleep staff because he skipped it back in chapter 17x. So Berserk is really our option of last resort, and it doesn't really solve the problem that he poses towards our blue units because, you know, he can still attack people. The only difference that Berserk makes is that now he's able to target red units in addition to blue units. And the ones in particular that we're concerned about are Ninian and Nino, the latter of which is also force deployed in this chapter. And both of them are one shot by the sniper aboard the ballista. So every single turn, we have to make sure that we have an option that's juicier, but also an enemy. On turn one, we drop both Ninian and Pence on Bolting Island. Bolting Island is inhabited by three mages and a sage, and the mages all have bolting. We peel one of them away, with Hector in such a way that the other two cannot go for him, and that causes them to switch to the next most juicy target, which is Ninian. Ninian has to dodge both of them this turn, otherwise, if one of the mages is left alive in a future turn, he will be able to kill her with Elf Fire at low HP, and that is more accurate. The Sage can always kill Ninian, he's just that strong, but it doesn't matter because the FE7 AI is programmed in such a way that they will always prefer to use status staves over killing a player unit, which is as dumb as it sounds. Pen's position is very particular. He has to bait away one specific wyvern that threatens that square, and fortunately that group that he pulls him from doesn't have group AI, so the other wyverns don't move to interfere with her plans. And this square does put him in range of a sleep druid, but fortunately he got a barrier from Lucy's turn 1, and that means that his hit rate sinks to about 20%, and the same goes for the Silent Sage, so we can easily dodge both of those. Our first manipulation of the Berserk Sniper involved giving him an Archer at low enough HP for him to KO, and we weakened him on the prior enemy phase with Fiora, who had a Short Spear and also a Delphi Shield to avoid taking effective damage. On this player phase, Heath and Fiora are going to one round two of the Bolting Mages with near-broken Javelins. 
And the reason why we use Near Broken Javelins is because, contrary to what this playthrough may demonstrate, Heath, Fiora, and Farina are all really pacifists and want to show their enemy that we approach in peace. But actually the reason why we did this is for more status staff AI manipulation. In this game, if you don't have an equipable usable weapon, then you're not considered to be an eligible target by the enemy status staff users. And all of our flyers are about to fly in range of multiple of them, including two of the bishops up the top of the screen that have status staffs but not really a whole lot of range, and also that sleep druid that we engaged on the previous enemy phase. So by breaking our weapons, none of our units in range are going to be targeted and we don't have to rig any dodges whatsoever. Someone who does end up getting targeted is Heath, and that's by none other than Sonya, the boss of this chapter. She has a very strong bolting tome, so strong that our flyers over there cannot live both her and the wyvern that broke away from his friends to attack us. Heath and Farinar are left extra vulnerable because they are carrying Jafar and Hector respectively, who were pulled over there by a really convoluted rescue chain involving the literal rescue staff. But fortunately, we're able to do some AI manipulation that splits their attacks so that Heath baits the bolting with his lower res, leaving Farinar at full HP to take the wyvern attack. We did a second Berserk Sniper manipulation, and it involves Lucius using Purge on the last Bolting Mage to put him in KO range. This gets rid of all the Bolting Mages so we don't have to deal with them anymore. In exchange, Lucius ends up getting silenced, but this is a blessing in disguise because then Pent doesn't, and that way he is available to do a double Physic on the next turn. And we also have a Restore target for Sarah now on turn 4. We had to have Pent use Physic on Freena and Heath this turn to top them off for the subsequent enemy phase because this is the turn that we're going to drop Jafar and Hector near the throne, and we need to play a bit of defense, because Hector's survival, especially against Sonya, is really questionable. He needs literally every magical durability boosting tool that we have, aside from Ninus's Grace, in order to avoid being one-shot from Sonya. Without a combination of the Talisman, the Angelic Robe, and a near max pure water, he would just die in one hit. That's just how strong Sonya is. And he's left a null of HP that he needs to be protected from every other enemy that's nearby, which is why Jafar, Heath, and Farina were in a defensive formation, and we divided those enemies to attack them in a way that none of them were at risk of death. If you were astute, you may have noticed that Hector was dropped slightly too far away from the throne, at least that would be the case for a vanilla Hector, but the fact that we used boots on him allows him to reach the throne on the subsequent player phase. Harkon agrees with Sonya's opinion on Nino and that she's dead weight, so he picks her up to slow himself down, and this way, he avoids doubling the wide from reinforcements. Now he creates another great target for the Berserk Sniper, and it also allows him to grind down his Silver Axe to exactly two uses, which is what he needs to do for next chapter. For the boss kill on Sonya, we had to bring Jafar in, because our flyers are nowhere near strong enough to kill her, like Heath, our strongest flyer, critting her four times with the Brave Lance does half her HP. And Jafar himself isn't strong enough either, even though he has like the highest base strength in the game with the exception of Harkon. He doesn't do enough damage if he crits twice with the Killing Edge. He can activate Silencer though, but Silencer has half activation rate against bosses, so he ends up with about 10% chance to Silencer per attack, but it is poetic justice for Jafar to be the one to kill Sonia. The last thing we want to do before we leave Gatorade Palace is pick up the speed wings from a chest beneath the middle of the three generals on the island. Killing generals with flyers is very tough because they have high defense and effective weapons like the heavy spear suck, but Hawkeye spent basically the entire chapter walking towards that place, and he's up to the task. Finally, we can fly in with a flyer to stack the chests, and then we're basically done. That is chapter 28x, completed in four turns. We will see you next time for Kaga Destiny. See ya!